morning. morning. I'm Amy Dowerball. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a member of the Universalist, Unitarian Universalist Area Church at First Parish in Sherburn. Welcome to this house of worship. Come in bringing all of who you are. Bring your seeking soul, searching for meaning, searching for love. Here we covenant to walk together in ways of integrity and service. We help each other find the courage and commitment to live our faith fully. We keep our minds and hearts open to each other and to the mysteries that lie beyond our certainties. Here we gather in community to celebrate our common life. Notice those who need you. They are here. They are everywhere. Let us worship together, willing to be authentic with each other, honest with ourselves, and open to connection in all of its forms. Welcome. Morning, everybody. For those of you who are here and brave the snow, congratulations on hardy New Englanders. And for those of you at home, we're jealous of you in your slippers and pajamas still. You waved everybody through the camera on, the, on my right, your left. <clears throat> Just a couple of announcements this morning. So one, so we all know, and by the way, for those who are home and don't know who I am, I'm Reverend Nathan Dietering, one of the ministers here. Um, our intern, uh, Jason McClinn, is not here today. And that's because, I don't, think, I don't know if you said an announcement, that he has um, been called back to his other part-time job. He is a blue man in the blue man group. And they had opening week, he lost that position because of COVID, and they had opening weekend uh, this past weekend. And it was written up in the Globe, I think, on Friday, and he actually was quoted there, which, which was great. So um, we're trying to comp some tickets, uh, so <laughs> we'll see. Um, just, and again, just a couple of announcements. So on March 5th, thank you, I have so many dates in my head, we have the uh, Justice Forum. It's going to be on Zoom. It should be in the weekly email, and um, we have... A, a terrific program that's scheduled for that and if there's a sliding scale for fees so just look at the email and all the details are there and then on March 6th what are we going to do everybody who was here last week we're going to vote on what eighth principle amazing um, and you'll hear more uh, from Reverend Heather uh, in her sermon today about that as we lean into this work and hear a testimonial from Judd Wolfskill as well so, and there's more information all the way in the back um, in the, uh, near the name tags about all of that work and some of the folks from the 8th Principal team will be there to answer questions and to dialogue with you. So with that, I invite you to offer your greeting in the way that feels comfortable for you. Ask permission for those around you should you want to shake or hug or fist bump or whatever else. Good morning, everybody.
Our opening words this morning are adapted from author Aurora Levin Morales' poem, The Hafta. Say these words when you lie down and when you rise up, when you go out and when you return, in times of mourning and in times of joy. Another world is possible. Don't let despair sink its sharp teeth into the throat with which you sing. Make them burn so fiercely that you can follow them down any dark alleyway of history and not lose your way. so that we and the children of our children's children may live. Good morning. I'm Reverend Heather Concanon, and that mix-up was my fault. Thanks for bearing with us. Our first hymn this morning is Where You Go, and I invite you to rise in body and spirit and hum along.
please remain standing as Georgia and Susanna Wolfskill come forward to light our chalice. Please say together our covenant. Love is the spirit of this church, and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another. everybody. This morning for our Wonder Box, I would like to invite anybody up who would like to see the Wonder Box up close. Anybody of any age, come on forward. I'll give you a hint. There's uh, going to be a little bit of a skit from your staff, so if you want to see that up close. I mean, I wouldn't sell it that much. <laughs> <laughs> this is less rehearsed than our Christmas pageant, so. Which is saying something. <laughs> And we're not going to open the Wonder Box actually until after the skit. So if you want to sit back there a little bit. Well, Skull Girls, you are so big. I haven't seen you in so long, and you've grown up so much. It's amazing. <clears throat> All right. So this morning we have a story about three friends. So it was a warm summer evening, and it was that really glorious time between supper being over and having to get ready for bed. When the fireflies started to appear one by one, and three kids went outside to play. But what should we play? Asked Tabitha, who was the oldest by four months and two days. She had bright shiny braces and beads braided into her hair. Let's play the coolest game ever. It's called Tag, said Alex, who was the next oldest by two months and 15 days. He always wore his baseball hat sideways, and he always wore his t-shirt tucked in. Let's play hide and seek. I want to play hide and seek, said Sheena, who was the youngest of the three. She had three braids in her long, dark hair, two little braids on the front on either side of her face, and one big braid that hung down her back. To be clear, my mom makes me tuck in my shirt, but when I go to school, I untuck it. Let's play tag, said Alex. Hide and seek. Tag. Hide and seek. Tag. Hide and seek. <laughs> Stop it, <laughs> said Tabitha, stomping her foot and crossing her arms. Let's vote. Sheena looked at Alex, and Alex looked at Sheena, and then they both said, Okay. <laughs> we can have secret, oh, go ahead, Tabitha. We can have secret ballots and everything, said Tabitha, and she ran inside her house and brought back paper and pencils and a shoebox with a skinny hole cut in the top. Sheena took out her piece of paper and wrote, hide and seek, neat in neat and careful letters, and then she folded her paper and put it through the skinny hole into the box. Alex and Tabitha were already done. Right, now we count them, said Tabitha, and she took the lid off the box and unfolded each paper. Tag, hide and seek, tag. It's two to one, tag wins. Who likes tag the most, by the way? <laughs> right? <sighs> okay said Sheena, and the three of them played tag until their parents called them inside to get ready for bed. The next night, Tabitha brought the shoebox and they voted again. It's two to one, said Tabitha. Tag wins. 
Sheena sighed again. Okay. Tag won the next night, too. And the night after that, and the night after that. It's not fair, said Sheena. We voted on it, though. Alex replied, and that was true. Besides, they lived in a democratic country, and in a democracy, voting was the way to decide. It's still not fair, Sheena muttered. And so the next night, when Tag won again, she decided not to play. Oh, come on, said Tabitha. Tag isn't fun with only two people. Tag isn't fun at all, Sheena said darkly. I'm tired of playing tag. I quit. Tabitha looked at Alex, and Av Alex looked at Tabitha, and they both looked at Sheena, who wouldn't look at either of them at all. <laughs> Tabitha jingled the bra beaded braids in her hair, and Alex turned his baseball hat so it pointed the other way. <laughs> then Alex said, Are you going to go to, like, D.C. and complain about it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, maybe instead of voting all the time, we could take turns. Take turns? Yeah, two nights playing tag, because there are two of us who like to play it, and it's better. Then one night playing hide and seek, because there's only one of you. Spoiler alert, Nathan's going off script. <laughs> we could start tonight. We could even play hide and seek for a couple nights in a row, because we haven't played it at all yet. How's that sound, Sheena? That yeah, sounds great. I'm going to go hide. OK, fine. <laughs> that means you're it, Tabitha. And he and Sheena ran off to hide while Tabitha closed her eyes and counted. And sometimes slow, sometimes a little too fast. When she got to 100, she yelled, Ready or not, here I come. And on that warm summer evening, in the glorious time between supper being over and having to get ready for bed, as the fireflies appeared one by one, the three children played outside until their parents called them home. Thank you very much to our actors. <laughs> so this morning we're talking about voting, and we're talking about voting and different ways to make decisions as communities. So this skit just showed us one way to make decisions as a community. And our church community makes decisions together also. And as many of you know, we are about to make a big decision in March, on March 6th, and we're going to vote on whether our church wants to adopt the eighth principle, which last week the kids in religious education talked about what that means, and we'll be talking about it to get again to together today. But we also have a different thing that we want to vote on. We have a different voting uh, thing that we're going to do together as, in, as a community. And that voting thing is that we are re repainting Alliance Hall. So Alliance Hall is the green room that's downstairs. If you go down uh, these back stairs and you take a left, it's the one on the left. I had to orient myself to the church. It's, we're not going to call it the ugly one, <laughs> though many just did. So we've decided as a community that it's in need of repainting, and we have chosen some options. And we're going to make a vote between these four options. Um, so if, if my actors could come back up and hold up some options. The ki so here's what we're going to do. Can somebody open the Wonder Box for me today? Yeah, Su Georgia. What's in it? A bunch of star stickers. Thank you. OK, so what we're going to do is uh, there are four options. You can show them the options. All of the options have a dark color on the bottom <laughs> and a light color on the top. And everybody is going to get to vote. Anybody of any age can vote. Whether you're not, you're a member, you can vote. And the way that we're going to do it is there's these star stickers. And there's three star stickers in, on each strip. And you get three stickers. So you get three votes. And that's it. So you can put your votes on all three on the same color. If you really, really like a color, you want to give it a lot of weight, you can put it on one color. If you like three colors, you can put them on three different colors. If you like one a little bit more and one a little bit less, you can put two on one and one on the other. Nathan has a clear favorite. He's going to put three on one, I think. So the voting is going to happen. They're going to be up here after worship. And you can come vote up here after worship. 
Uh, you can also come, if you're at home, you can come by any time this week. You have to vote in person, unfortunately, but you can come by any time this week and vote. They'll be in Heather Walker's office all week. And then we'll be uh, having voting again next week, after, and it'll close after worship. So we're going to practice voting uh, this week on paint colors, and we're very excited. It's going to be painted uh, during February vacation, so next week. Do you have a question about voting? Oh, what a good question. What if you want to vote on the lighter color? Okay, so these are all the options are together. So it's going to be on the, the bottom below the chair rail and then on top above the chair rail. So they're not, um, you can't vote on like this one and this one. They're, they're together. So you put your votes right down here on the part that says votes. So you're voting on the whole, this, you know, the, the slate, right? Yeah. All right, are we ready to do some voting? Awesome. So they'll be over here after worship. If you're at home, come by anytime this week. And uh, this morning, we're going to have... Um, so I think, kids, if you want to vote, you should come by after worship. And they'll be here, all right? Um, and this morning, kids are going downstairs with uh, Julia and a few other leaders to talk about the eighth principles as well. Uh, if you have kids in the program, they will meet you up here after worship. And also... Uh, we are looking for teachers for our spring religious education program that starts on February 27th. So if you're interested in teaching this spring, please let me know. And let's sing our children out. Friends, take a deep breath with me. <clears throat> Find yourself in yourself. Feel your body in the pew <clears throat> or at home, resting on the couch or the chair. Notice your breathing and the beat of your heart the life inside your body. And join in centering as we listen to our meditation hymn, our prayer hymn, Courage, My Friends. Friends, every week we cross our threshold, whether it's here in our sanctuary or the threshold of this hour, and we hold our prayers for loved ones and the world and our gratitudes for the grace and the gifts that we do not have to earn in order to thrive. Our prayers for this morning, and I've gotten so many um, notes and requests uh, for us to name and think of and hold the family, the Sherburn family, 
of Owen Bingham, who was a Dover Sherman High School senior, and he lost his life in a car accident early Saturday morning on 1 a.m. on Saturday morning. They had a um, vigil for him and his family and his friends at Pilgrim Church down the hill yesterday. And Anna Hurley, who is a member here and principal of the high school, reached out to me. So we're holding this, just this whole community in love as they deal with this unspeakable loss for the Bingham family. And Donna Allen and many others asked for prayers for our own Janet Snyder, who is deep in the throes of her illness with cancer, illness of cancer, and so we're just holding her in our love and our light as she moves through that diagnosis. And Donna also asked us to hold Sarah, who is a high school um, senior, I believe, when she was here with Family Promise, which is the homeless um, program for congregations to house homeless folks in our buildings. And Sarah was here when she was a high school senior, and now, recently, she just graduated with a master's degree, which is amazing. So for these names and for the many more, including for Sherry, who is the niece of Reverend Heather, who is struggling, we light a candle, this candle, a symbol of the light and the love that radiates from this place. And as we look out into, it's beautiful this morning, through the windows and the snow, so many prayers here for all that is happening, all the uncertainty in Ukraine this weekend, last week, this weekend, and what may come next week. For this and for so many others, we light a candle for the world. And gratitudes, I ask our prayers of gratitude and hope for my wife, Karen, who has a second job interview on tomorrow. I'm hoping for her. It's been a long time after losing so much for work because of the pandemic. And also just for the world and how beautiful it is. Yesterday was 60 degrees, everybody. And today it is snowing. And rather than cry about that, we're just going to be thankful for the beauty. Let us light a candle. Please join me in prayer. Dear God of our many names and our no names, source that receives our longing, our tears, our laughter, our hoping, source that lives below us and around us and above us and between us, source that we call love and light and grace and God. Fill our bodies this morning with courage. Remind us how courage simply means to have a heart, to be full of heart, as we wrestle with the continuing uncertainty of this pandemic, as we, as we wrestle with how we can stand on the lines of racial justice and vote here in this community and be called forward. Help us have courage as we parent our young ones, as we parent our parents who may be older, and as we look in the mirror on how to be kind to ourselves, help us to have the courage to be loving to ourselves. 
and to push away the critical voices that tell us we're not enough. We could be more. We could do more. That shame us into silence. Spirit of life, help fill us and our bodies with courage. Let's be held in silence together.
invite Judd Wiskill up for our testimonial. Welcome, Judd. So I have to go to the hospital, and I don't know quite where I'm going. So I go in the front door, and I look for the information booth, and it's a lobby, and there's an information booth right in the middle, and there are a lot of people up front. Um, there's a long line. So what do I do? I do what everybody does. I'm, I'm looking at my phone, and I'm just barely noticing the rhythm of people going up, getting information, going about their business, going where they need to go. But all of a sudden, the person behind the desk um, who has black hair and, and may or may not have been a person of color, we'll call her Janice or Lucia. I don't know what her name was, but her voice changes. And all of a sudden, she's asking someone whether they have an appointment. She says, Are you, do you have an appointment? We well, have to have an appointment. And it makes me look up, and I notice that at this point, the woman behind the desk, Janice or Lucia, is talking to an African-American woman, probably younger than me, and that woman is just wanting to know where her doctor is. And she doesn't have an appointment, so she has to kind of argue just to figure out the basic information of where her doctor is. And eventually, she gets that information and she walks upstairs to, to where her doctor is, and she's frustrated, she's visibly upset. And I realize, not long after, I realized that I could have done something. You know, I cho chose the kind of normal way to respond to that situation in my white middle class upbringing, which would be not responding to it at all. Minding my own business, you know, keeping out of it, keeping the peace even though the peace I was keeping, the peace I was allowing to, to hold, hold place there was not a just peace, right? I did the polite thing. I did the quiet thing. And what I could have done, given that I've got privilege, given that I'm a, an able-bodied white cisgender male, is I could have gone up and said, hey, could you give this person the information they need? I could have asked for a manager because when people who look like I do ask for a manager, they often get response, right? I could have provided some help there. And so I, I want to be accountable. I want people to tell me if I make that kind of mistake, right? And I want to have it in my mind not to make that kind of mistake, but to show up, to show up for people. And so what I see in our eighth principle is an opportunity to be accountable. An opportunity that tells us that um, we're on a journey together towards spiritual wholeness and we want to fight oppression. And we want to demonstrate that fight. We want to be on a journey together where we call each other to account and where we think about how we do things as a community. And this will help. This will give us a text that says, hey, you know what? We need to be doing that. We need to be reminded of that so that we can call each other to account. Because we live in white supremacy, right? This is the culture we live in. And if we don't do anything, then we're trying to stay neutral on a moving train, right? So what I ask is that we, we vote for this principle because it's going to help us be accountable and move together toward beloved community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judd. So inspired by this work, our offering this morning will be given to and shared with the Massachusetts Center for the Native American Awareness. And the mission of this organization is to preserve Native American cultural traditions, to assist Native American residents with basic needs and educational expenses, 
to advance public knowledge and understanding that helps to spell inaccurate information about Native Americans and to work towards racial equality by addressing inequities across the region. And so every Sunday, you guys, we give away our offering every single, every single Sunday. And as we move towards this vote on March 6th, um, I ask us to just think about this organization and all the others that we've given to over this time. Thank you so much for your generosity.
So this morning I am going to share the third sermon in our Eighth Principle Sermon Series. And as you know, our congregation is considering adopting an Eighth Principle, in addition to the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism. And these seven principles were adopted by the Unitarian Universalist Association in 1984. And if you're curious about what the seven principles are that we're considering adding to, you can find them in the front of your gray hymnals, which are in your pews, or if you're at home, through a quick Google search. In our denomination, the Unitarian Universalist Association, or the UUA, which is made up of all of the Unitarian Universalist churches across the country, about a thousand Unitarian Universalist churches, our denomination is considering adopting this eighth principle nationally. But the process of considering it and changing the bylaws of our association, which is what it would require, is a necessarily much longer process than the process for an individual church to change their bylaws or to adopt the principle themselves, which is why many churches are considering it, including us. And many con churches are considering doing this uh, across the country, adopting the Eighth Principle for themselves as we work on it nationally. And at this point, 153 churches across the country have adopted the Eighth Principle. And as a church community, we are talking about this because we want to adopt it as a whole community. And this is a shift from individual commitments to anti-racism and anti-oppression work that is contained within the Eighth Principle to, the collect, to a collective commitment to this work. We are asking, as a community, do we commit to this work? Do we believe collectively that our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us to this work? Today I want to share with you two important pieces of context, two stories from our Unitarian Universalist history that are extremely important context for the Eighth Principle in Unitarian Universalism. So our first story begins in the late 1960s, and it is referred to commonly as the black empowerment controversy. In this context, it was the height of the civil rights era. Unitarian Universalists had been proudly involved in the March on Washington, Selma, in passing the Voting Rights Act. King was assassinated in the midst of this story. And the story begins in October of 1967. There was an emergency conference on the Unitarian Universalist response to the Black Rebellion. That's what they called it. And this was in reaction to increased riots in cities across America. Soon into the planned conference agenda, the majority of African American attendees withdrew from the agenda to form the Black Unitarian Universalist Conference, often referred to as BUC. And to understand the context of this move, we need to understand that in civil rights work and in anti-racism work, both then and now, there's often a tension about the importance of integration and multiracial organizing and the importance of identity-based caucusing. Buck was firmly an identity-based group of Unitarian Universalists, who were bl of black Unitarian Universalists, who were seeking empowerment and self-determination in our overwhelmingly white denomination. Coming out of that meeting, October 1967, Buck had several proposals, including a call for black representation on the Board of Trustees, the UUA Board of Trustees, the Executive Committee, and the Finance Committee, subsidies for black ministers, and the creation of a UUA-affiliated Black Affairs Council, which would be funded by the UUA at $250,000 per year for four years. They brought this back to the conference, and the entire conference endorsed these proposals. However, when the proposals were brought to the UUA board, the board rejected them. So organizers worked for the next several months to get a resolution to fund the Black Affairs Council on the agenda of our denomination's annual national conference. It's called General Assembly, and it happens each year in June. So at the 1968 General Assembly, just a few short months after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, setting the tone considerably for the meeting. The delegates at the meeting voted, voted to fund the Black Affairs Council by a vote of 836 to 326, approving for a million dollars, one million dollars over four years. However, soon after General Assembly that year, it became clear that the denomination's finances were in dire straits. In response, the UUA board reintroduced the issue of funding the Black Affairs Council 
at the following General Assembly in 1969, newly requiring a yearly reaffirmation of the previous four-year commitment. At General Assembly in 1969 in Boston, the funding question was placed near the very end of the meeting, where the energy would be low. Members and supporters of the Black Affairs Council made a motion that the vote of the funding be moved toward the beginning of the agenda to reflect the urgency of the issue. However, they did not receive the two-thirds majority needed to change the official agenda, and a motion was made the following day to reconsider the funding issue sooner. A motion which, the funding issue, which we need to remember, was never supposed to be revisited. It had already been approved. It was never supposed to be revisited in the first place. And when that second motion to move it earlier on the agenda failed, the Black Unitarian Universalist Caucus members silently walked out of General Assembly. Several hundred white delegates also left General Assembly in solidarity and support. The funding was recommitted to later in the agenda, but, and, and it was later reduced by the UUA board to address the budget, budgetary constraints. But the damage had already been done. This moment, referred to as the black empowerment controversy, or sometimes the 1969 walkout, was and still is a source of great pain for many in our Unitarian Universalist history. Some estimates believe that we lost about 1,500 active black Unitarian Universalists in this denomination, who left the denomination after what they fairly experienced as a betrayal and a broken promise for material and financial support. Now before I tell this next story, I want to name that despite these moments of pain and falling short about, around racial justice, Unitarian Universalism is also the place where I personally came to understand anti-racism work as a deeply spiritual calling. Growing up in our Unitarian Universalist faith shaped my political and my social justice viewpoints more than any other factor in my life. The first time I heard about anti-racism work and was introduced to it myself was in General Assembly in 2003, the same meeting, when I was 14 years old. And from there, I have been formed and shaped and challenged and nurtured by this faith around addressing topics of power and privilege and white supremacy. Unitarian Universalists have long been leaders for justice in many areas, and I am quite proud to be a part of this denomination. Recently, I was reading some information on the Eighth Principle, and they addressed the question of why the Eighth Principle specifically names racism. And I've heard several of you ask this question as well. I've shared my perspective on it at times, saying that I think racism, and particularly anti-black racism, has a particularly horrific history in this country, whose very economy and infrastructure, whether or not we are in slave -owning, former slave-owning states, was built on a system of chattel slavery. But my reading on the Eighth Principle has reminded me that Unitarian Universalism has made truly remarkable progress around the inclusion of women and LGBTQ plus people in our congregations, in our ministry, and in our leadership. Many UU congregations have done incredible work to make their spaces more accessible to people with disabilities. But in contrast, the inclusion of people of color in our congregations, ministry, and leadership has been starkly lagging. And this brings us to our second story, the hiring crisis. The year was 2017. This was just five years ago. Nathan and I were both your ministers at UUAC. The Black Lives Matter movement was just a few years old. This was the year that our congregation put up the Black Lives Matter flag out front. And that spring, a crisis was unfolding once again at the denominational level. Our Unitarian Universalist Association is split into five regions, and they have st we have staff who support congregations in each region. At that time, the southern region was hiring for a new regional lead, a high-level executive position. Reverend Andy Burnett, a white man and an ordained minister, was announced as the person hired as the, new as the southern regional lead while Christina Rivera, a Chicana Latina woman who is a longtime religious educator and director of finance and administration in one of our lar larger congregations, was told that she was not the right fit for the team. 
As this news spread, critics pointed out that all of the regional leads across the country were white ministers. Other of people of color who were passed over for positions within our denomination began to tell their stories via social media and other channels. And in a letter to the UUA board, signed by over 120 ministers and other religious professionals, they said, the practice of hiring white people nearly to the exclusion of hiring people of color is alarming and not indicative of the communal practice to which our faith calls us. As Christina Rivera explained, again, the religious professional who was told that she was not the right fit, she said, when you're a person of color and you hear the word fit, that is a huge red flag. It's coded language that signals that unless you look like the person doing the hiring, no matter how qualified you are, you will not be selected for that position, no matter what it is. Other accounts of structural racism and white supremacy within our denomination began to be named publicly, in addition to the hiring controversy. And that spring, three people in high-level UUA leadership resigned over the controversy, including the UUA president, Peter Morales, and the UUA's director of congregational life, Scott Taylor, who had done the initial hiring that led to the controversy. And in response to all of this, the UUA board pulled together a team that was commissioned to analyze structural racism within Unitarian Universalism. It was called the Commission on Institutional Change, and the commission studies, studied and researched this for two years, working with the UUA to understand what happened, interviewing religious professionals and lay leaders of color, and doing what they called a racism audit on our denomination. And the resulting report on their findings which was called Widening the Circle of Concern, has been a guiding uh, piece of work for much of the work of our Eighth Principal Task Force this year. I highly recommend it if, you've, if you'd like to take a look at it. And I will say that both of these stories have far more intricacies and nuance than I've been able to lay out here. And if you are interested in learning more about either of these pieces of our Unitarian Universalist history, I or the 8th Principal team would be happy to share more information or point you toward more resources. And both these stories, the 1969 black empowerment controversy and the 2017 hiring crisis, are reminders that white supremacy exists not only in the world at large, but also in our faith, in our churches, in our communities. Not because we mean harm or because we are bad people, but just because it is the water that we swim in. And this is part of why the Unitarian Universalist Association and our congregation is considering adopting the Eighth Principle. And let me read it to us again. Can we put it up on the screen? We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote, journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community, by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. I love what Molly shared with us in her testimonial last week, when she reminded us to pay more attention to the verbs than the nouns in this principle, the verbs that call us to action. Echoing Molly, I'll say, I don't know what spiritual wholeness feels like. Because as a white person in the context of white supremacy, I feel like my spiritual wholeness has been limited by knowing that my whiteness keeps me from full and deep relationships with people of color, and knowing that white supremacy harms me too. I don't know what spiritual wholeness it feels like, but I do know what it means to go on a journey and to do it in community. And I don't know exactly what multicultural beloved community is because I feel like I have only ever seen glimpses of it. Because the re realities of racism and oppression keep me from this too. But I do know what working feels like. And I do know what building feels like. And I do know what longing feels like. Longing for a better world and working and building together. And I don't know exactly what a world without oppressions would look like because I have never lived in that world. But I do know what dreaming and also dismantling feel like. Taking things apart, going back to the roots, imagining a better alternative, 
dismantling so that we can build back something more beautiful and more whole. Adopting this principle is a commitment that as a community, we will keep journeying, building, working, longing, dreaming, and dismantling. The vote is not the work. The vote is our collective commitment to the work. Last Sunday, when we were talking about the eighth principle in our coming of age class, I asked them to do an exercise with me that I learned from Pippi Kessler, a brilliant mentor in, work, in doing anti-oppression work with young people. And I asked the group to list out all of the ways that the systems we live in are broken. And we didn't stop listing them until we had filled up a whole chart paper with a list of broken systems. Friends, it was depressing. And then I flipped the page and I wrote, another world is possible. And the energy shifted as we filled up a second page with all of the things that we dream about that could be in this beautiful, more healed, more whole world. Because as much as we can be in touch with the pain of the world is as much as we can be in touch with our hope for a better world. I believe that our pain and our hope come from the same place within us. And friends, there is nothing more than church, than Unitarian Universalism, that has helped me to stay in touch with both my pain and my hope. I believe that our work as people of faith is to live with, in, with one foot in the world as it is and one foot in the world as it might be. I believe that religion and faith is the bridge between both of these worlds. And even though, as I shared in our stories today, even though our faith is not perfect and our human institutions fall short of our ideals, we can imagine another world, a better world. And I believe that our faith and our church is a place to practice being the kind of community we want to be, to begin to build beloved community here together. To adopt the Eighth Principle is to say firmly and clearly that we believe, as Unitarian Universalists, that we are called to work to build that better world that we imagine. We are called to make amends for the ways that the systems that we live in and benefit from and participate in have caused harm to people with marginalized identities. And I believe that together we can be builders, we can be dreamers, we can be dismantlers, we can be repairers as we take this journey together. May it be so, and amen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn, Building a New Way. Please hum along.
Please join in our call to ministry. We go forth into the world in peace to act with works of love, to affirm each person's dignity, and to cherish the living earth. Poet Ar Arundhati Roy writes, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Friends, may we listen closely for the world that is on its way. May we usher it into being. May we be drill builders, dreamers, dismantlers, repairers on this journey together. May it be so, and amen. Please vote for your paint colors, and we will have a good afternoon. <laughs>